Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Hoosier farmers are making less money per acre than they have in years, but some are trading corn and soybeans for solar panels. Brock Turner talked with one farmer who has crops in both Indiana and Illinois, and he says the incentives vary greatly from state to state. Mark Simons has been farming for 44 years. The majority of his nearly 1,000 acres are corn and soybeans, but he's in the process of adding another crop into his operation, one that also relies on the weather. The word solar farm kind of capsulizes it because the electrons produced out there are just another crop. Instead of producing uh, carbohydrates, we're producing uh, clean, renewable energy that uh, goes on for a long time. The uh, solar projects out there, it can be producing power 40 years from now. Simons says he'll have things up and running and delivering electricity to the grid before the end of the year. It's a sizable investment, but he believes the payout in the long run will be more than worth it. It's a multiple million dollar investment in uh, roughly eight acres. Simons plans to install 4,500 modules, and he's joining a growing number of farmers across the country who are hoping to diversify their revenue streams. While there isn't a single agency that keeps an exact count on the number of panels or farmers, experts say the number has increased significantly since the cost of solar panels decreased about 10 years ago. And that decrease has made the math work for Simons. To me, it's another crop. That's how I look at it, and that's how any, any businessman would look at it, I think. Uh, you just got to compare the, uh, the costs and the, the revenue. But as with most crops, producers are reliant upon a number of factors that determine the price they get. Simon says selling electricity back to the grid is filled with regulation that often changes. While his local electric providers are encouraging, he says it's not that way in other parts of the state. Utilities have a lot of political power, a lot of money behind them. They would like to see uh, power production stay in their hands rather than uh, uh, making it more egalitarian through more distributed energy. I think the big money wants to you know, maintain their uh, uh, control of the power system. But the end goal of utilities and electric providers is important to remember. Rural electric cooperatives, which serve a large portion of Hoosiers living in rural areas, are nonprofits. Their primary goal is to provide cheap power to less dense areas where the economics don't make sense for private providers to operate. When we do a deal, we're always looking to see how does this stand up on its own. So uh, we don't want to overpay for power. Brian Anderson is the Director of Economic Development and Public Relations at the Wabash Valley Power Alliance a nonprofit that provides electricity to individual member co-ops. They're the ones that are transmitting and generating the electricity that could be powering your home. We want to protect our members from, you know, long-term price spikes or things like that. We want stability. So when we negotiate or we talk with a, a private landowner that maybe is producing more than they need, we're always thinking about that long-term price stability. What's in the best interest of maybe not one particular member, but the 330,000 members that are under our service. Up the MDP, out here, up our pole, to their pole, and across the street. So that is their pole right there? Yep. Two years ago, Indiana ended its net metering policy, which incentivized solar by providing customers the higher retail rate instead of a lower wholesale rate for excess energy they delivered back to the grid. Despite that policy shift, Anderson says he's seen more people interested in solar. We've seen an uptick in, in interest from just landowners in general looking for sustainable solutions and making some of those economics work by selling some of that energy back to the local utility or to a utility at a larger scale like us. But energy experts say it's unlikely Indiana will return to net metering. Instead, they say it's important to craft durable policies that won't change over time and will span across elections. We don't have evidence as of yet as to which model is the best, but I do think it's really important for states to think through their individual kinds of um, charges and, and what's necessary and, and of value. So we do see in absence of um, strong policy leadership, we see companies actually stepping up as well. Um, I'll also note that there's, there's le leaders and laggards, and there will of course be some companies and some states that lag behind the others. And in those cases, yes, it probably will happen. It'll just happen much later than, than those that are taking the leadership role. Carly says the cost of solar has decreased significantly in recent years, and the technology has improved too. 
it's projected that uh, we'll get uh, 1.85 uh, million kilowatts out of here. That's enough power in a year to power approximately 180 homes. While Simons admits the policies in Illinois make it more economical, he's excited to get these eight acres in Indiana operational. If you're producing electricity at uh, a high enough rate, if you're, your payback is pretty darn good on solar. And it's much better in Indiana, or much better in Illinois because they have renewable energy credits that uh, help defray the cost, the initial startup cost of a solar system. And uh, it'd be nice if Indiana had some of those incentives. But Simons isn't complaining too much. There's more money in producing electrons than in producing corn and soybeans at this time, particularly at this time. <laughs> For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner.